God, please prepare our hearts. Open up our hearts to see you, to love you, to press to know you, God. I pray that you would be at the center of all of this, Lord, and that our hearts would be captive, our hearts would be tied to you, Lord, and that we would know you and love you. Speak through me, speak through this word, and may your name be glorified at all times through this message. I pray this in your name, amen. All right. So today we're going to be talking about Jacob and a specific moment in his life as we're continuing through the throwback series. The throwback series is a, is a sermon series through the book of uh, Genesis, right? In the very beginning, what happens? What happened in the beginning of Genesis? Creation. God created the earth. What happened after creation? The fall, right? Sin entered into the world. We messed it up. What happens after the fall? The flood, right? The world was so wicked, God said, I'm going to clear it all, and I'm going to have a new start. He does that with Noah. And yet the world is still sinful after the flood. And so God chooses Abraham, a, a complete Gentile. You guys realize Abraham was a Gentile. He, was, he worshipped other gods, and God chooses him, and he says, in you all the nations shall be blessed. And so God starts to work the gospel through Abraham, and he's been working it this entire time, but it's becoming more and more obvious that God is bringing about salvation through the lineage of Abraham. And so Abraham has a kid, Isaac, right, who he had when he was 100 years old. And then Isaac has twins. And the twins are Esau and Jacob. And what ends up happening is Jacob, Esau was uh, Isaac's, the dad's, favorite son. And, but Jacob was the mom's favorite son. And so Jacob tricked his father and his brother by having his dad, Isaac, bless him instead of Esau because his dad couldn't see, so he kind of deceived him. So J Isaac thought he was blessing Esau, but actually he ended up blessing Jacob. When Esau found out, Esau was kind of those like rough guys. He was a man of the field. He was a hunter, and he was really mad, and he wanted to kill him, so Jacob ended up fleeing and leaving uh, he ended up leaving to his uncle, probably, you know, a couple of hundred miles away, which was far enough, uh, and he ended up uh, falling in love with his uncle's daughter, and, and he said, look, I'll serve you for her. And so it's interesting because the uncle says, okay, serve me for seven years. So he serves him for seven years, and on the wedding day, he doesn't give him his, the daughter that he loved, he gave him the other daughter. Instead of Rachel, he gave him Leah. And Jacob wakes up in the morning, which is an interesting story of its own. He wakes up in the morning, he's like, hey, this is the wrong daughter, right? Uh, and, and he's like, oh, yeah, I tricked you, but, you know, I have to marry off my older one first. So serve me seven more years, and I'll give you Rachel as well. Okay, deal. So they had a deal. He served him for 14 years. Guys, are you willing to work seven years straight, like, for free for, for a girl? I thought that's also a very interesting uh, point. So, girls, if he's not willing to serve your dad for seven years straight, he's not worthy of you. So, <laughs> uh, so he, he serves for 14 years, and then his uncle keeps tricking him. Like, after he starts working for him, he starts, like, he's taking care of his goats, his sheep, and he starts saying, okay, I'm going to pay you this, but then at the end, he pays him something else, something less. Or he says, I'm going to give you this, and instead, he gives him something else. So, Jacob keeps getting kind of cheated. At one point, he says, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to take my wives, my kids, and I'm leaving. And so he starts leaving. He starts going back down to his parents and to Esau. And he is at, he's going, and he knows he's about to meet Esau, and he doesn't know. There, there wasn't like any text message like, hey, Esau, I'm coming. He's like, no, you're not coming. I'm really mad at you. You know, there's none of that. There's, there's, he doesn't know what's going inside Esau, and he, Esau might just kill him, and he knows Esau has many men, uh, like an army, right? And he can just kill him in one day. 
So this is the context of, of where we're at tonight. Open up your Bibles to Genesis 32, starting from verse 22. Genesis 32, starting with verse 32. Genesis 32, starting with verse 22. This is the night before he meets Esau. It says, The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Jabbok was a small river. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. Basically, the sun has risen, morning has come. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew on the, of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he t- touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. As I started studying this passage in preparation for this sermon, I realized there's one central theme around this passage, and it's Jacob's encounter with God. Now, I know that word encounter might have some negative connotations in the Christian religious world, but think of it as just, you know, you, when you, an encounter is when you meet someone, when you, you know, you come face to face, when, when you have some kind of close interaction with somebody. This is Jacob's interaction. This is Jacob's encounter with God. And there's so much that we can learn about an encounter with God through this passage. And we're going to just go through this verse by verse and see what it is that we can learn about this encounter with God and hopefully take some things away for us. First of all, we see that this time, this encounter with God that Jacob had is taking place during the most fearful time in Jacob's life. God doesn't just come to us. God doesn't just appear to us, you know, when everything is going great. Sometimes the closest times you're going to have with God is in your darkest times. You realize this was the most fearful time. Jacob is going, trying to go to sleep that night, and he's thinking, this might be my last night because tomorrow I'm going to be dead. Just complete fear complete trembling, and yet that is where God met Jacob. God can meet us in our most fearful places when we feel like God is far away, and yet he is so close to us, and exactly that it might be the place where we will meet God face to face. So don't be overwhelmed, but cling to God. The next thing in verse 22, let's read it. The same night he rose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the fort of the Jabbok, and he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had, and Jacob was left alone. Notice Jacob had a lot of people with him, and yet in that moment as he encountered God, he was all by himself. Guys, this is key right here. When it comes to meeting God, He was all by himself. You know, I love jam times. You guys know jam times that we have at retreats? I love that we can sit there, that we can read the Bible, we can pray. This is a great time. 
But that is in no way a replacement for being literally, physically, by yourself, alone with God somewhere. And that is where Jacob encountered God, when he was all by himself. And we should do the same thing because even Jesus, when he was in the flesh, even Jesus spent time alone with God. Not just at church, not just in Bible studies, but alone with God. Luke 5, verses 15 and 16, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Guys, when's the last time that you took time to be alone with God all by yourself, not just at church, not just in a Bible study. Those are all really good things, and we should be doing those things. But when was the last time you were just alone with God by yourself, nobody else disturbing you? Because if Jesus had to do that, then how much more should we be doing that? How much more should we be spending time alone with the Father When's the last time you went for a drive? When's the last time you locked your door in your room and you prayed? Or if you don't have a room, maybe just just get in your closet and just pray and just be alone with God. When was the last time you withdrew to a desolate place and spent that time with him? Next, we see in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. In verse 26, then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Out of this entire passage, this is what stands out to me the most. He wrestled with God until the breaking of the day. He wrestled with God until the very morning. He didn't give up. He didn't give up, guys. Just think about that. The problem is we give up. When it comes to us and being with God, encountering God, we give up way too quickly. We are so addicted to instant gratification. It's like, I tried praying for two minutes, for three minutes, even 10 minutes. Nothing happened. And so I just got up off my knees and I didn't do anything else. I just gave up. I just went back to doing the same exact thing I was doing before. We are so addicted that if God doesn't do a miracle, God, you got 10 minutes. If you don't do a miracle in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm getting up off my knees and I'm walking away back to my old life, back to the way I was. We're so addicted to instant gratification, guys. We just ha- we, you realize that the time we're living in right now is there has never been a time like this ever in the history of the world where literally billions and billions of dollars are spent every single year to get you, I don't have my phone on me, to get you to be addicted to the apps on your phone. It's called instant gratification. Gratification means to please, to satisfy. Instant means instant satisfaction. Literally, billions of dollars go into researching and thousands and millions of people literally sitting, brainstorming, thinking of ways how to make their app more gratifying, more addicting than the competitor's app. Do you guys realize that? Literally, millions of people think about this the entire year, about how to make it more addicting, because if they can make it more gratifying than the competitor's app, then you will be on there more, and they will make more money off of you. We have never experienced anything like that in the history of the world where so much intentional effort has gone into creating such addictive content never so i understand i sympathize with that the challenge is great we're so used to it if it's like if you get on youtube and it's boring for the first three minutes five minutes you just get off right you're not going to watch a youtube video that's boring for five minutes but unfortunately we apply the same thing in our relationship with god 
We, we pray, we pray, and it doesn't really do anything, and, and we, just, we will just walk away discouraged. God, you didn't really speak to me. I, don't, I feel dry, I feel this. But did you really try praying? Did you really seek him in his word? Guys, I want you to be honest with yourself. Did you stay up all night like Jacob did until the breaking of the dawn? And this isn't just applicable in, our, in us seeking God, but it's also applicable in our holiness, in our holiness and in our fight with sin. Because look, look, what, look what Hebrews says, Hebrews 12, 14, I'll read it for you. It says, strive. It's interesting because the same word that's used with Jacob, right? You have striven with God. It says strive. That means fight for, work for, the pe- strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for holiness. Fight for holiness. The word of God is urging us to fight. Not to just try a little bit. Not to just give it our best shot, but to strive Guys, I, I just want to be really real right now. When is the last time you spent two hours on your knees praying through the temptations that you are getting? Instead of praying for five minutes, temptation doesn't go away. Okay, I'm just going to go in, give into it. I'm going to go watch that porn. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do whatever. When was the last time you spent two hours on your knees begging God for help? in the midst of that fiery trial. If you need to, stay up until the morning comes because the Bible calls us to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Same chapter in Hebrews 12, 4, it says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The scripture sets this as the standard of how much we ought to pursue the holiness is that it's shedding our own blood. It's not just wasting five minutes on your knees, wasting two hours, wasting a whole night. It's literally shedding your own blood. Your holiness and your struggle against sin is more important than you physically shedding your own blood. Because Jesus says it is better to enter into the kingdom of heaven with an arm that is cut off than to be cast into hell with two hands. Amen? That is what we are called to. Psalm 105, 4 says, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. It doesn't say if you try seeking Him and He doesn't show up in the next 10 minutes, you're good. It doesn't say if you seek him and it's good for a month and then after a month he kind of stops showing up, then you don't need to seek him anymore. It says seek the Lord and his presence. Seek his presence continually. It means until the very last breath of your life, we, all of us, should be seeking God. Guys, and I urge you, seek God. Seek his presence always. Doesn't matter. You feel great. You feel horrible. Doesn't matter how you feel. Seek his presence continually. Whether it's the best day or the worst day of your life, seek him always. Not what your feelings tell you. Our feelings are important. There's a whole other, I can talk about our feelings for another hour, but the most important point is that seek his presence no matter what all the time, continually, no matter how you're feeling, seek him. And guys, finding God, experiencing God, encountering God, knowing God is more important and more valuable than anything else. Guys, it's God. It's God. It's not Success. It's not a relationship. It's not marriage. It's not family. It's, it's actually God. It is our creator God who loved us and gave himself up for us and is calling us into eternity with him forever. That's the God that we're called to seek continually. 
And even if it takes your entire life of you becoming a nun or you becoming, you know, a monk and, and for 80 years seeking God, not, not, not five minutes, not a day, not a week, not a month, not two years, not five years, not 10 years, but 80 years, even if that's how long it takes for you to seek God, and you do nothing else in your life but find God after those 80 years, then it will be all worth it. Because 80 years, in light of eternity, in light of the trillions and trillions and trillions of years that we will live in eternity is as nothing. Seek God. Guys, it's just crazy Because think about this, we're willing to spend hours studying for one test. We're willing to spend hours on YouTube. We're willing to spend hours on Instagram, hours on video games, hours on movies and Netflix. And we're discouraged after 10 minutes of trying to seek God and not finding Him. Guys, there's something really wrong with us. There's something really wrong with us, and our priorities are just completely on their head. But there's hope. There's hope. God says, seek and you shall find. Seek, guys, seek and you shall find. And we're gonna see what happens to Jacob here, and it's amazing. Um, Luke 18 Verses 1 through 8, uh, you don't have to open there, but I'll read it for you. This is a parable that Jesus gives about uh, the persistent widow, right? You guys, you guys remember that parable, the persistent widow, the widow that keeps asking? This is super interesting. It says, and he told them a parable to the effect, or because, so that they, would, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Why, why would we lose heart? Why, you know, Jesus told a parable to people so that they would always pray and not lose heart. Why would it say and not lose heart? Because probably a lot, Jesus knew that a lot of times in our prayers we will be tempted to just lose heart. Guys, does that make sense? So it's normal. It's normal to lose heart. It's normal for the struggle to be hard. As you seek God, as you pray, I'm sure for Jacob it wasn't easy to wrestle with God. It wasn't easy to say, I will not let you go until you bless me. But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing, right? To not lose heart. Keep seeking him. Keep coming to him. Keep asking him. Verse 26 Genesis, and then he said, let me go for the day has broken, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's interesting because Jacob didn't even let go of God even when God told him to let go of him. Jacob didn't let go of God even when God told him to let go of him. Jacob was stubborn with God in a good way. And God loves that kind of stubbornness. God wants that. He wants that yearning of saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. It's fascinating because we see this happening constantly in scriptures. Even when Jesus was, was walking, right? Uh, uh, the, the, we talked about this woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon, the Canaanite woman. She had a demon-possessed daughter. And, and he said, she told him, heal my daughter. And he said, Jesus told her, it's not good to take bread and throw it to the dogs. From the kids, throw it to the dogs. I mean, that was offensive. Jesus called her a dog. And, and yet she was stubborn with God. And she said, but, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. Jesus wasn't really pushing her away. Jesus was building up her faith. And in her faith, she said, she humbled herself and she said, I just want some of those crumbs. And he says, great is your faith. And he blessed her, and he cleansed her. We see these other passages in Exodus 32, 
This is when the Israelites left Egypt and they're on their way through the desert and they're just sinning against God and God says, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they're stubborn people. Now therefore, leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you, Moses. But Moses urged the Lord his God and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken upon bringing against the people. First time I read that passage, I'm like, did God really change his mind in that passage? Like, think about it. Did God really change his mind? Like, he set out to do one thing, and then he happened to talk to Moses, and Moses kind of convinced him otherwise, right? That doesn't make sense, because even if, like, think about this, God knows all things, he knows the future, so if God knows the future, then he would just need to fast forward to that time and say, okay, well, and he would automatically hear what Moses would tell him, therefore he would have already, like, heard that argument and changed his mind before he even talked to Moses, therefore never having to talk to Moses, right? You guys, you guys understand where I'm coming from? It doesn't make sense, unless God was trying to do something else. What God was trying to do is he was trying to test Moses. He was building up Moses. Because you know what? You know what the temptation for Moses was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate these people. They want to kill me. Yes, kill them. And yes, make a great nation out of me. It's going to be great. But instead, God was building up Moses' character. He was building up his leadership to, to sacrifice for these people. And he says, no, don't kill them. And, and he was building up Moses instead of having him selfishly seek his own benefits. Proverbs 17, 3 says, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. God doesn't test us because he really doesn't know what's, what, how we're going to react, and he's really curious and he wants to find out. That's not why God tests us. The way God tests us is the same way a silversmith, someone who works with silver, tests silver. It's, he puts the silver in to purify it, to cleanse it through the flame. And that's the way God tests us, is to cleanse us, to purify us, to make us more valuable. And so when he told Jacob, let me go, he was testing him. Guys, there will be times in your life as you're praying and you, you are seeking God and there's nothing. And what that could be is just God testing you. God testing you to see if you will push through that and seek his face despite the silence, despite the dryness. Seek him. Guys, seek him. He is good in all that he does, in everything. And I just urge you to seek God with all your being, with every fiber in your existence cling to God then we see in verse 27 and he said to him what is your name and he said Jacob very often when we encounter God when we meet God we there is a self-knowledge that occurs there's something that we realize about ourselves and who we are in that moment you guys realize, you think, oh, Jacob, okay, well, what's the big deal? Like, first of all, if he was God, why did he ask his name? Because he already knows what his name is, right? Yeah, God knew what his name was. But you realize, do you know what the, word, the name Jacob means in Hebrew? Do you guys know? Say it. Worm. What? Worm? Worm? Jacob is the deceiver, right? He's the one who, or in other words, the one who grabs by the heel. You know, it's like, I guess that, that was the Israelites' way of like tricking people, you know, <laughs> grabbing by the heel. The one who grabs by the heel, he's the deceiver, the tricker, right? And he, you realize that when he asks him that name, it, it's, so, it's such a loaded question. Because up until this point, this has been Jacob's identity. This is who he is. This is what he's done to people. He's deceived his father. He's deceived his brother multiple times. He's deceived his family. 
He's deceived his uncle, right? He's been deceived by his uncle, so he's been hurt by this. He's hurt other people by this. It's just, this is his old identity, and God is just kind of like putting it in his face. Who are you? And he's saying, I'm the deceiver. So often, when we encounter God, there is a knowledge of who we are. God exposes us. In those closest moments, he shows us who we are. John 12, 46 says, Jesus says, I have come into the world as light. So Jesus is the light. John 3, 20 says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light. It does not come into the light for fear that his works should be exposed. People don't like to come to God because God's light exposes our wicked works. Guys, and maybe there are some of you here and you're running from God because you're afraid of your works being exposed. You're running away from that. You're lying to yourself, guys, and I just urge you, just step back into God's light. Let him expose you because I'll show you what he does after. Let him expose your wicked deeds because it is totally worth it. Imagine you have something dirty on your face, right? You got dirty, you're... you're Somehow you got dirty, and you walk into your bathroom, and you start looking in the mirror, and it's too dark, so you flip the light, and the light doesn't work. If the light doesn't work, you don't see the dirt on your face, right? You don't see it. You don't understand it. You don't realize how dirty your face is because there's no light. But when you turn on the light, all of that is exposed. You see it in full detail. And it's the same thing that happens when we encounter God. He exposes our heart and the darkness in it. Guys, if you are struggling with seeing your own sinfulness, all you need to do is seek the presence of God. You don't need to look at yourself. You just need to turn the light on. You just need to take a quick glimpse at God, and then you will realize how sinful and how wicked you really are. You don't need to focus on your own wickedness, believe me, because you could actually really go astray, just constantly, I'm so wicked, I'm so wicked. If you're trying to, if you have the lights off, meaning you don't see the glory of God, and you're trying to find that dirt on your face, you might actually get it wrong. You might be scrubbing this side, but you have dirt on this side. The key is first to see the glory of God because then the glory of God will expose your wickedness in a way that is actually accurate. Are you guys following me on that? We shouldn't focus on that, but we will notice it when we see the glory of God. Isaiah 6, Isaiah, he's a prophet, and he had a vision, and he's seen the mighty God on the throne, and he's just, he's sitting, and there's these huge angels flying around him, worshiping him, trembling. They can't even look at him because it's so bright. They have wings that are covering their eyes. They have another set of wings that they're flying with, and all they're saying is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Isaiah seen the glory of God. You know what he said? What did he say? Woe is me. I'm doomed, he's saying. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So interesting. He's seen the glory of God, and instantly his sin was exposed. He didn't realize his sin, and then God revealed that to him. But he's seen God, and then he realized his sin. He was horrified at what was revealed about himself. Guys, if you're having trouble seeing your sin, focus on taking a look at God. Focus at looking at God, and you will realize crazy things about yourself. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 28, and then he said, This is God speaking to Jacob. And then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. This is beautiful. Not only does God expose who Jacob is, not only does God give him that self-knowledge, but God also gave him a new identity. 
He doesn't just expose his old identity, but he gives him a completely new identity. He renames him into something so much more beautiful, into something so much more honorable. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Not only does experiencing God in the light of his glory expose our darkness, but it also changes us. It also cleanses us. You just need to take one peek at yourself in that bathroom if you see the dirt on your face, and immediately you're going to clean yourself up. Immediately. It's not even an option. It's not a question. And that's the same thing that happens with us. And it's fascinating because even in this passage with Isaiah, when Isaiah is seeing God and he says, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips, what was the very next thing that happened? The coals. The angel flew up with some coals from the altar and brought them to Isaiah's lips and touched his lips and it says, you have been purified. God doesn't just leave you in your sinfulness when he exposes it. Guys, and this is my encouragement to you. If you are running from God because you're afraid of his light, you're afraid of your wicked deeds, of being exposed, of people finding out who you really are in your secret life, you don't have to fear the light because not only will the light expose you, but the light will transform you but you have to let the light in. You have to let God's light and God's glory in for it to change you. Let him expose you and be changed at the core. Verse 29, and then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? It's so interesting he has this experience, and then Jacob asks him, well, what's your name? And God, just the typical Jewish answer, says, why is it that you ask my name? He just, he just responds with a question, you know, to a question. He doesn't give him an answer, and that's it. There, there's nothing after that. He just drops it. And Jacob lives the rest of his life wondering what his name was and never finds out. It's amazing because we could have the most closest moments with God. We could be so close to God so often, and yet there will still always be more to God. There will always be something more to learn about him. He is infinite. God will, there will always be something that we have not yet learned. There will always be more to learn, more to know. Guys, and I want to encourage you that when God gives you these precious moments of being with him and you grow in the knowledge of him, praise him for that, but don't let that be a source of spiritual pride for you. Be humble and realize that this is just the beginning. I still don't know everything. And if you don't know everything and God is infinite, then you have no room for pride because, yeah, you might know twice as much as the person next to you, but relative to all that there is to know about God, you still know only an infinitely small amount just like your neighbor. There's no room for pride when it comes to the knowledge of God. In fact, I would say if you are becoming proud you are no longer learning about God because God doesn't have pride in him and he doesn't support pride. You've already gone off the path and it's only going to be a matter of time until the rest of your sins catch up. Remember, pride is always that first sin and then something else and then something else and then something else. There is no pride in the knowledge of God because we realize there's always more to know about him. He is infinitely deep. There is more. And, and we, instead of just looking at other people and saying, oh, I know so much more, we just want to pursue him. We want to know him. There will always be more to know about him. Romans 11, verses 33 through 35, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Guys, just soak this in. Just close your eyes and soak this in for a minute. Oh, the depth 
of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Or 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, this is Paul speaking, the wisest spiritual person on earth besides maybe Jesus. He says, I know now in part, only a little piece, but then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. Yes, God knows us fully, but we don't know God fully. And we should be humble about that. Verse 30, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. You know that Jacob has just encountered God because of the humility that follows. Every true experience with God, every true moment that you have with God will always be followed by humility, not by pride. Guys, if you finish reading your Bible and you feel proud because of that, I guarantee you that was not time that you spent with God. Just right off the bat, I can guarantee you that was not time that you spent with God if you are proud after. Look at what Jacob did. Look at what Jacob says. My life, I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. Because you realize Jacob could have gotten up off from there and said, I prevailed against God. By his own admission, God himself admit to me that I have fought against him and I have prevailed against him. You realize he could have said that and that would have been actually accurate. And yet he didn't. He didn't. He had a heart of humility because he says, yet my life has been delivered. He didn't say, I delivered my life. I did this myself. He's saying, my life has been delivered to me. God has had mercy on me. God, God's goodness, God's power, God's greatness has had mercy on me. All true encounters with God result in humility. And that's why Isaiah says, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. He was not proud. He was humbled. Verse 31, and the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This is a really interesting point. The first thing I see in this, the first point is that every time we meet God, we are changed. We are changed a little bit. Every time we face God, every time we see God's glory, we are forever, our soul is forever and literally changed. There's an effect that happens for the rest of our life. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we all with unveiled face, that means uncovered face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Every single time we see God, every single time we see the glory of God, we're being changed from one degree of glory to another. There is a permanent change that occurs, and that encounter with God will leave a mark, a reminder. And for Jacob, it was a reminder for the rest of his life. The second point I want to say is that even after encountering God, Jacob walked away with a limp for the rest of his life. But you know what? It was worth it. And that limp didn't take away from his encounter with God. God might put you through some crazy circumstances to bring you closer to him. For some of you, I guarantee you, they say one out of four people are gonna get cancer. And God might put some of us, he might put me through cancer. But if you're his child, I guarantee you he will draw you nearer to that. You might die of that cancer. 
You might be permanently damaged by that cancer. But that limp does not take away from your encounter with God. It just means that this world is broken. That's what it means. This world is broken and we live in a broken world. And God is still good in the midst of all of it. And yes, Jacob had a limp. But that's not something he blames on God like, oh, if only I, if I didn't meet with God, I wouldn't have this limp. No. It was precious. That encounter, that meeting with God was totally worth all of it. We live in a fallen world. And we don't become perfect after we encounter God. And it's amazing because after that last moment, after he faced God, after he had that encounter with God, he was able to get up, even with a limp, and go face the most fearful moment of his life, Esau. He was ready. God had prepared him for that. Meet God. Meet God. Seek God. Be with him. Struggle with him. Wrestle with him. Do not let him go until he blesses you. Because Jacob knew he couldn't do it without his blessing. He knew he needed every bit of God in that moment. Don't let go of him. Don't let go of him prematurely. Guys, and I, and I want to make a really important point also here. We are not saved by seeking God. Seeking God in and of itself does not save us. The thing that saves us is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. That's what saves us. Jesus came and lived the perfect life that we could not live to die for our sins, for your sins, for my sins that we continue to commit. Jesus' perfect life and death on the cross pays for all of that. But the only way that we can have access to this payment for our sins is through faith, a.k.a. seeking God. Seeking God does not save us. Seeking God only gives us that access into the salvific work of Jesus Christ. And so all the glory goes to him and none to us. It's not like, oh, I was seeking God and, and, and you know, God saved me because I was seeking him so much. No, that's not what saves us. And it's amazing because if it wasn't, you guys realize, if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Christ, Jacob would have died that night. God would not have had mercy on him because there is no, there is no mercy apart from Christ. And I think it's fascinating that Jacob literally wrestled with God, who he calls God, who is also a man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ was Jacob able to be saved, to be blessed, and that's the only way that we can be saved and blessed, is through Jesus Christ, is by seeking him, by coming after him, Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly forgive. Luke 11, verses 9 through 10 says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Guys, this is a promise from God to all of us. Let us seek him. Let us not give up, but let us pursue him and cling to him the way Jacob did. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, you know I'm the first person that needs to hear this sermon. You know that I'm the first person that quits so quickly when it comes to seeking you. Lord, I'm so 
weak, God. I love comfort. I love the easy way out, God. I, I just, I quit. I tap out. I just, I'm done, God. And I just pray, help us. Give us that strength to cling to you even when the hip is dislocated, God. To cling to you in the midst of that pain, whatever it is that we're going through until the breaking of the day, until you bless us, God, help. Lord, please. Lord, it's so easy to let go. It's so easy to not hold fast to you, God, and we pray. Lord, and I pray for those, Lord, who are avoiding you, who are not seeking you, God, those who are running from your light for fear that they will be exposed. God, I pray that they would turn around and stop running and would come to you so that they would be exposed and that they would be transformed. Jesus, we pray this all in your name. Amen.